Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Mental Health During COVID-19, Answers for Families. It's brought to you by Boston Children's Hospital. My name is Bethany Tripp. I'm part of the Enterprise Communications team here at Boston Children's. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and is also live on Facebook. So if you miss something, you'll have the chance to go back and watch it all over again. We know that you have a lot of questions and there's a chance we won't be able to get to all of them, but don't worry, check back with us on our social media channels and in our answers content hub, where we'll continue to post relevant stories and information for you and your family. Today, we have three wonderful panelists to help guide our discussion. Dr. Heather Potts, Dr. Fred Kern, and Dr. Chase Samstall. Um, can you all please just introduce yourselves quickly? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, my name is Heather Potts. I'm a psychologist in outpatient psychiatry service at Boston Children's Hospital. My name is Fred Kern. I'm a pediatrician at Bridgewater Pediatrics. And I'm Chase Samsel. I'm a child psychiatrist and a pediatrician. I'm the medical director of the psychiatry consult service on the medical, surgical, and ICU floors here at Children's Hospital. Great, thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in because we have a lot to talk about today. Um, so to kick things off, Chase and Fred, um, let's get this going by um, just overall addressing um, the, the mental health crisis and what you're seeing. I think for the past 15 months, the pandemic has impacted uh, every human being on the planet. And I don't think there's been anybody, adult or child or teen, who has been negatively impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And I think as pediatricians, uh, being really being on the front lines and helping families, children, and teens, I, I break it down into three major issues. I think issue number one for kids and families has been the isolation from friends and family. Uh, it's been terribly disruptive to, rela to relationships, both within families and within friend groups, uh, for people to be isolated, uh, to be left at home, concerned about uh, contracting coronavirus or sharing it and spreading it to other family members and friends. So I think the isolation has been the top question that we hear from parents. Um, we know that everyone has missed out on the usual reasons to celebrate life, such as picnics, birthday parties, graduations, family weddings, and I think especially hard-hit have been the relationships with grandparents. I've had countless families that have had a new baby, and the grandparents are just yearning to be with that new child, and they can't be because they have health risk factors or they're elderly. Uh, so I think that family dynamic has really been stressed for, for most of our families. I think the second greatest area of impact that uh, parents talk to pediatricians about is the impact on child development and the academic progress. Uh, just this morning, uh, uh, a well-resourced uh, family that uh, mom was a healthcare provider, uh, she made an appointment for her two-year-old to see me today just to talk about his language development. She's very concerned about his communication skills. And even though he seemed like he's gonna do okay to me, uh, even as a healthcare provider, she's very concerned that the isolation, uh, the masking um, is gonna negatively impact his communication skills. And I think that's a concern that a lot of families have. And of course, the struggle that all children have had with remote learning and hybrid learning uh, has, has been uh, an epic challenge for all children in terms of their education. Uh, the going back and forth, some schools have had to uh, go from in-person back to remote learning because they've had increasing case numbers. It's been very disruptive to, uh, to learning and to uh, family routines. Um, and then of course, uh, we've experienced many families that have had a positive uh, coronavirus test within the classroom so the teachers have to be taken out of the classroom. Uh, their friends have to be removed. The whole class might be on quarantine. And that too has been very disruptive to normal learning for our patients. And I think lastly, from a big picture point of view, uh, the, the real struggle that our kids, teens and families have had is just the curtailment of freedom to be a kid, to learn, to grow, uh, to attend theater or, or music classes to engage in sports and hobbies and other activities that require group activities, religious experiences. Uh, these are 
so important to the developing child um, throughout the age group uh, from toddlers uh, through young adults. And uh, these things have been negatively impacted, of course, by the pandemic's isolation. So uh, that's all the struggles that we primarily see. And the good news is that I think with um, the uh, arrival of uh, very potent and safe vaccines that we're beginning to see um, a resurgence of life as we once knew it. Um, and hopefully with the vaccine starting in the teens, uh, kids will have more liberty to get back to life as they once knew it. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Kern. I, I agree with everything you said. I, I think it's really important to acknowledge too that no child is an island and not just the things that are personally happening for them, but what's happening in their families and the community, society and the world, right? I think there has been so many challenges for guardians and parents who have yeah. had to weigh their job with mm -hmm. helping their child do remote learning there's been so much financial distress when people are losing their jobs and, and the distress that happens in a family system affects children. And certainly with the coronavirus, just fears of infection and whether things are safe out in the world from an infection standpoint. And many children we've seen have had loved ones that have gotten very sick with COVID-19 or died and the impact of that grief and fear, um, let alone I think all the in social injustice that has had a, a more important spotlight shined on it recently, but also some of those increasing, you know, isms, the racisms, I think all of the different distress out in the community and, and us as a society, that's a challenging place, especially when children are feeling isolated, not around their friends, and perhaps even things like increased cyberbullying and things like that that happened during during this virtual environment. And it's a lot. This is a lot, I think. I think all three of us can agree that we've met very few families who feel like they've got it all together and everything is very easy during these times. I, personally actually get a little skeptical and worried when people say that, that everything has been fine in the past 15 months and, and wonder if people are, are, are telling us the whole truth because it is very, very hard. I think we call this the mental health fallout of the pandemic. And I think a lot of families and children are noticing that while society is opening up and things are trying to get back towards normalcy, some of these lingering distress us as human beings and our, our psychology is hard. This, is, this has had lasting effects and we're all trying to recover, not just physically, but emotionally and psychologically from, from some of these things. I think it's really important to point out some of the limitations we have in our current mental health care system here in the United States for kids and families, adults too, is that we've had ongoing severe workforce shortages of psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers for kids and a non parity system that hasn't always supported things or were not enough of us to go around before the pandemic and the stressors of the pandemic has made this even worse. It's just skyrocketed the terms of need. So wait list to see a therapist, um, time coming into RER and all other ERs that service children around the community and states and the region where waits for things like inpatient psychiatric treatment or partial hospital programs are two or three times longer uh, than, than they used to be. It's just such a bottleneck and it's really, really still a challenge. And I think it's really important to, to be aware of that. I think when people ask what we can do, we always say, talk to your state legislature. Actually, just yesterday, there were three or four really important bills that um, the Children's Mental Health Campaign here in Massachusetts, one of the biggest sponsors being Boston Children's Hospital have been advocating for about patients with these long stays in ERs and medical floors waiting in patient level of care, continuing to think about parity and continued support for telepsych visits the virtual conference visits that we've been able to do throughout the pandemic, so many more resources for urgent crisis care in the community, as well as inter integrated, you know, school psych supports that I think are just so needed, have been needed for a long time. And I think we're all really hopeful that some of the negative fallouts of this pandemic will help reinforce the importance of in our community and as a state and institution. Chase, if I may also just add a, a special um, mention of children with autism and other developmental disabilities. I think from our point of view, these are the children and families that have been most impacted because children with autism rely on that structure. They rely on that schedule. They, they are, their lives are enhanced by being in things like ABA therapy and mm -hmm. meeting with occupational therapists, physical therapists. And because of the pandemic, that support structure has really been uh, taken out from underneath children with and families with autism. So um, 
you know, in general practice, we have a particular heart for these families because they're the ones that are really struggling. Um, and also, I just want to mention as we get started today that uh, from a medical point of view, we've really seen the epidemic of obesity simply skyrocket in our in our kids. And uh, I'm concerned about that from a health point of view, but I'm also concerned as we're talking about behavioral health considerations today is the bullying uh, issue um, and um, the mental health issues that can be a fallout from um, diminished uh, self-image. So um, maybe Heather could speak to that issue as well, but we're really seeing an epidemic of obesity because of the pandemic. Kids are exercising less and we're all probably going to the pantry a lot more than we used to. And that also uh, ties into, I think, a, a point of, um, it, you know, what are the signs, right? What, what, what can parents be, and car, uh, caregivers be mindful of, you know, as, as they're watching their children, you know, and I agree, we all have definitely um, uh, experienced a, a significant cost, you know, because of the pandemic. And, um, and so when, when it comes to those sleeping, eating changes, eating too much, eating too little, um, those are signs that your your teen or even yourself or your, one of your loved ones might be struggling. Um, so it's a sign to be paying attention to. So, um, and um, also, you know, you know, related to that, maybe they're struggling now, or they might struggle later when they um, when they do um, uh, return back to uh, at least some whatever the post uh, post uh, pandemic normal will be. Um, but absolutely, you know, um, there have been some significant, you know, and. Um, challenging um, uh, concerns that have been happening and uh, things that parents can be mindful of is that along with like, you know, if your child seems more sad or irritable, those are some other signs to be paying attention to that they might be um, in need of help. Yeah, I think Dr. Kern, Dr. Potts, I think you're both highlighting one of the other hopeful benefits of, of all of this all the challenges, which I, I think there's just been so much more attention drawn to mental health that has had so many celebrities and athletes, even politicians, other public figures who have been open, I think, about some of their symptoms and their emotional well being. That I'm hopeful it's just making it a much more normalized experience, Absolutely. reducing stigma out there, helping people talk about these things more regularly, knowing that it's not some sort of weakness. This is a part of human nature, and really it takes more strength to ask for help and to acknowledge what's going on. And really that's the path through. That's the part to get better, not to ignore them, not yep. to be in denial about them, not to shame those things, but to really talk to your pediatricians, talk to your therapist and your psychiatrist, you know, talk to your family members, right? As parents today, I mean, that's so important to be able to model and be mm -hmm. importance of asking at, about those things and, and telling them yourselves and to realize you can talk about them without it being too scary. And it's really important I think especially during times like this, right? I think one of the common questions I'm sure all three of us get all the time is saying, I I'm feeling so worried about X, Y, and Z throughout the pandemic and what, what, what can I do? I think my, my child has been the same way. The first step being acknowledging that this is scary. And yes, I'm too I'm worried or I'm too I'm anxious and I can move forward, right? That being depressed or being anxious does not prevent you from being able to continue to function and to move forward and continue to do the things that you like and love to do and want to do and need to do to keep feeling better. Absolutely. It, I think it's so helpful that we normalize the conversation about mental health and about emotions and feelings. Uh, feelings are not inherently harmful, right? That everybody has them. We're all experiencing something as we're going through this. Um, and so I, I think it, parents and caregivers can absolutely, you know, ask and ask regularly, talk about feelings, talk about, you know, uh, the impact and that some level of stress is fine, right? Like that is the human experience that we're all living right now. And so to normalize that, and then from there, be that great model of, and right, this is what helps me, right? This is what I'm going to do in order to um, try to improve what's going on right now um, is I think the, one of the most powerful things that parents can do right now. I think it's really important, Dr. Kern, how you brought up the, the trends you're noticing about obesity. I think, right, our, our mind and body is connected. This is why we have a neck, right? These things are not separate from each other. They have influence on each other. And I would say we have noticed similar things, that there have been more teens who've been trying to focus on ways to help with their emotions. And sometimes that comes in terms of, of eating, 
and feeding and sometimes not eating and feeding. Mm -hmm. We've seen in our emergency settings, a lot more kids coming in who have been binge eating to try to help them manage their emotions and feel a little bit better, not just because it's distracted and there's nothing else to do, which I'm sure certainly happens, but also the opposite, which always sometimes is more challenging, I think, for us as clinicians and also parents to recognize is that sometimes teens have really lost a lot of weight and are really malnourished. And we've seen really increased rates of, of anorexia nervosa and other restrictive eating disorders compared to previous years here at Boston Children's Hospital in the, in the mm -hmm. past 12, 15 months. It's really been another thing that skyrocketed that I think really deserves some special attention to be monitoring too. The function of these behaviors, right? I mean, so many teens are looking for control and sometimes it's not the most adaptive way or the thing that we wish they wouldn't try to control to help with those things, right? I mean, self-harm self is, is another version of this where people are like, well, I'm feeling really out of control, but here's something I, I can do. And, you know, eating way too many amount, big amounts of food or not eating enough food to, to, to be well nourished or to harm one's body, maybe temporary reprieves for, for some distress that teams have, but they're not the, the healthiest way to do that. And they often get very, very out of hand. These are some things that a lot of parents, we urge them to be really mindful of and that, that we look out for when we're been checking in and evaluating teens and, and children recently. Right, and just like the point that uh, you made earlier, where um, we're seeing uh, a surge in behavioral and mental health problems in children and teens, and that has brought good attention to the issue that was, was there previously before the pandemic. Uh, so that's an opportunity for us as healthcare professionals. The issue of nutrition uh, has always been an important one. And, and when we do identify uh, some kids and teens that are really uh, struggling in the obesity area, we can uh, really commit to trying uh, to find solutions for them. I know our dietitian is adding sessions uh, seemingly weekly to, to help um, make a dent in this situation for our families. And I think it's another opportunity, uh, as you mentioned, Chase, to control what you can control. Um, you know, how about let's get outside, the weather's nice, let's, let's walk 30 minutes together, um, let's, let's have a challenge, who, who can walk the furthest, who can do it in the best time, let's do it together uh, as a family and, you know, um, cultivate those intra-family relationships, get outdoors, get exercise. That's certainly good for, for my psych psyche. I know that, and I, I think it is for most of us. So let's look to the positive, let's control the things that we control. And, um, and hopefully we're gonna see some lifelong benefits when people really start to um, pay attention to their nu nutrition and their exercise. That's a great general, uh, great tip of like, schedules and structure. I think we, you've said it a couple of times and I'll, I'll repeat it again, right? You know, especially during the pandemic where like our normal like schedule and structure got ripped out from under us, right? You know, and it was really important that we created that structure for ourselves because I mean, we, we thrive in that. And so that is another sign to be paying attention to. Are you um, less energetic for, you know, activities like going outside? Are you um, uh, even just like getting out of bed to like make dinner? Seems exhausting. Those are some signs to be paying attention to, but also that, you know, a, a, a key um, tool is what we call, you know, scheduling, right? Let me schedule a day of what I'm going to do, including pleasant activities, going for walks, trying to remain as social as possible, even if it's Zoom, right? You know, just trying to remain connected with people has been really important. Mm -hmm. And I think so many of you are tuning in today because you, you probably have, you know, important concern about how, you, how your children are doing mm -hmm. or your loved ones are doing. And I think that that really warrants a lot of applause. I, I think it, it takes a lot to sort of seek out these resources when so many things are probably competing for your time and stress out there. I think, you know, we often hear things like parents saying, I can't believe X, Y, and Z has happened. I feel like such a bad parent, or I, I should have been able to prevent this. And I think it is a really important point of emphasis that, as we said before, there, there's no families out there that feel like the past year has been easy and that has consequences. And so many things that are outside of your control and distressing for your youth. And we really need to be able to give ourselves uh, a little bit of a break and be generous to ourselves to say that this doesn't make me a bad parent because my child is depressed or my my child is anxious or, or they've been 
cutting or, or, or they you know are binge eating or, or they're actually restricting their, their diet and they're, they're malnourished now. I think all these things are really, really important to say, okay, how can we move forward with this? Because during really big moments of upheaval in the world and society, these things happen and it's less important about how we got here and more important about how we can move forward and what we can do next, right? And that these are not things that can be um, just pushed away. They're really things that need to be worked through and addressed head on. You know, teens need to be validated and however they're feeling, exploring who they are or what's coming up. And the best places to get those resources and support is, is with your, your teens and your treaters. Talk to your pediatricians. They want to know about these things. I think Dr. Potts and I can both say that sometimes we, we work with youth who've been challenged with many feelings and, and families that feel overwhelmed and who are finally meeting for the first time. We, we've heard their pediatricians haven't heard it yet. And pediatricians want to be involved. I know Dr. Kern <laughs> agrees with us on, in this regard, but I think there's so many different avenues and options for treatment because it's really important when families are feeling distressed and kids are feeling distressed and there's impairment functioning to get professional help and support. So that means your pediatrician and that means a, you know, a therapist and or a psychiatrist that, that can be had and wait lists are really long, right? This workforce shortage that's happening out there and it's so important to cast a wide net, utilize all your resources to try to find out how you can get help. Make sure your pediatricians are always aware they can be great advocates. Mm -hmm. um, if they're lucky enough, like Dr. Kern's practice, they have some integrated behavioral health specialists in their actual pediatrics office. And uh, also because, you know, we don't want people to worry alone about these things. And we have specialized treatments to be able to help families get through this and kids to feel better. And, and I think too, that just by virtue of the fact that people come in and they share their struggles and their struggles are validated by the professional, whether it's a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, pediatrician, I think just telling your story is helps us get directed on the path towards healing and to, and to coping in, in, a, in a very difficult and challenging time. And just to know that uh, everybody, everybody's struggling out there. It's like uh, no, no, no families in island these days. And, and not only uh, to access your professional um, uh, contacts, but your community contacts as well. Uh, and teachers, um, clergy people, um, mentors in the community, um, civic groups like the, the YMCA or Big Brother program, uh, these kinds of things can be very helpful, uh, especially as people begin to feel safer with um, nearly half of our population having two vaccines now in the adult population anyway. You know, people are feeling safer and they're, um, they're, they're venturing out more. And I, I think that hopefully we're gonna see more and more kids and teens and families access the other uh, community strengths that are in each of our communities. We are gonna get moving on to questions and answers shortly. But before we do that, um, one thing I'd love you all to address is the terms mental health and behavioral health seem to be used pretty interchangeably. Can you touch on what the differences are between those two? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I think Heather and Chase should go first. <laughs> Don't fight over it. <laughs> well, I think that there's so much interchange. And um, honestly, I, 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 from for a caregiver or parent, it, you know, both services are going to be great, right? <laughs> you know, they both, you know, um, are going beyond the medical model. And I think that's, you know, just that the um, I have a stomach pain, right? And this is what I need in order to get better. That it looks more at the mental, you know, the emotional and the mental well being of the child as it relates to their emotion, you know, their behaviors and their functionality in the world. Um, and um, so um, when it comes to the nitty gritty of that, um, you know, I, I, I think you can, uh, you can, you know, tease it apart in, in various different ways, but overall the over, overlapping concepts to be really focused on are that it is about improving the whole child, right? Looking beyond just the physical symptoms and more at the emotions and, and the behaviors that affect them as well. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people will say they're confused because they'll go to different community centers and different hospitals and departments are named different things. And I, I think Heather and I can probably both agree that 
we're essentially talking about similar things or at least overlapping things. And I think in general, if we're gonna be true to form, mental health is probably all encompassing. So we're talking about emotions, psychological states. We're also talking about diagnoses and treatment plans, whereas behavior health is pretty much similar, but maybe is really mostly focused on behavior. So what are people actually doing? Or what are the literal interventions or treatments we're doing? And and maybe is is not as focused on, on the, the whole big picture, but I think both and and. You're not gonna meet a psychiatrist who only does mental or behavioral health, they're doing both. And so hopefully reducing some of that confusion uh, here, even though it's not crystal clear um, in the way that we're talking about it, because it isn't, it really it really isn't that, that crystal clear. And some of those terms are used interchangeably in the community for similar services. I think in our practice, we've definitely seen an escalation in the number of kids that we've diagnosed with anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, um, even traumatic disorders. So I think, you know, from a diagnostic point of view, we're clearly seeing kids that need high level of care, um, perhaps a psychologist, uh, perhaps a psychiatrist, um, for those kids that really are, are having acute uh, mental health needs. Uh, but from the behavioral health, I, I do agree with Heather and Chase that we talk about the self-care package all the time. Part of the self-care package for children, teens and adults is you brush your teeth twice a day, you try to eat well, you try to get regular exercise, you go to the dentist, you go to a physician, you try to sleep well, you have you try to have good community connections and relationships. So, so I think those things, paying attention to those core behavioral health, uh, self-care aspects, if you will, is really important and will help you know guide us through this pandemic. I think just to spend a little bit of time also talking about some of these urgent crises is really important too. I think I'm on the medical floors and I have a lot of colleagues in the ER here at Boston Children's Hospital. And I can say we've, we've just seen such an increase in the number of youth and with their families who are presenting in, in, in psychiatric distress, suicidal thoughts and feelings or agitation and aggression. We've even seen some more significant, you know, feelings of is, is someone manic or is someone having a bipolar episode or, or feeling psychotic throughout this pandemic. And unfortunately, those things are not surprising, right? As we're talking about all this distress in society, on families and individuals, it's, it's been an incredibly challenging year and that has consequences, right? We're not immune to, to those emotional states that have effects on us. And I think families will often ask, when do, when do I, you know, just call my pediatrician or call my therapist or psychiatrist or when do I come to the ER? I think any time a youth is feeling like they are actively, and by actively I mean you know, actively suicidal as in I am having suicidal thoughts and I think I'm gonna do something about that. I think I'm gonna act on that plan or you know, I want to die. Uh, any time those sort of statements happen, they need to be seen right away in yes. an emergency situation. So that means either calling 911 and, and do not feel bad about calling 911. That's an emergency, that's a life threatening emergency or going to your closest ER, right? I, I hesitate to say, don't drive two and a half hours to where you think you wanna go if there's a life-threatening emergency going on. And uh, you know, don't drive your loved one in a car if you don't feel like it's actually safe, right? If someone is really agitated or escalated or you're worried your youth might grab your steering wheel because they're just in such distress while you're driving, that's not safe for you, it's not safe for them. And hence why we always say 911. Mm -hmm. I think that in between sort of feelings of like, I'm so depressed and sometimes I wonder if it's worth living and things like that. Those are great questions. Uh, if, you, if you're sure that your youth is not wanting to die right now or feeling like they're gonna do something to hurt themselves, to, to try to urgently get a hold of your, your outpatient treaters, your pediatrician, your psychotherapist and or psychiatrist to sort of bring this up and, and to think about what to do and talk about it. I think here in our ER, we're gonna see all comers, right? When people come in, we're gonna evaluate them, but I think we often see people who you know with, with conversations to their with their pediatrician or therapists or or whatnot that may, maybe they didn't need to to wait and have this long evaluation for, for urgent things that actually could have been handled or you know so many times we'll hear that a therapist said oh if I had have known that I actually had a cancellation this afternoon I could have seen them or a psychiatrist like actually we've been talking about that all the time that's 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 not new I'm not too concerned about that but they definitely need to keep seeing me every week mm -hmm. um, when in doubt though I want to underscore this when in doubt if you are worried about the acute safety of your child you bring them to the ER you call 911 for sure but the waits are long 
And I don't want to say that with a discouraging tone to say, don't bring them in when you're in distress, but it's important for families to know about that. They're hopefully with a lot of advocacy we've done, it seems like the inpatient child psychiatry beds in our state are increasing by about 15, 20% over this calendar year, which is great, but that's not happening tomorrow. And inpatient psychiatric stays, this is not the 70s or 80s, right? They're only seven to 10 days on average. That's both a long time to be away from families and get you know your nine hours of therapeutic program a day. It's also not that long. It's, it's not uh, going to fix everything right away. It's gonna be intensive treatment, which is important and a start, but it's not you know the end and be all that's gonna fix things. And hence why it's so, so important to be able to get access to a treatment team with your pediatricians and, and other psychologists, social work psychiatrists to feel like you have that there because I think we notice on the ERs and the medical floors and on inpatient psych units, it's much more challenging to find good disposition and feel like we have a good safe plan and a supportive plan for families and patients when they don't have anybody yet. And we know that there are months long wait lists, but that's why it's so important to get on multiple of them as soon as possible to try to get those working and to keep advocating through your pediatrician and your psychotherapist, if you need psychiatrist, you know, really use this connection because it's hard out there and the workforce shortage is not going to change soon. So we all have to think smarter. I guess the last thing I'll say about this too is I'm very glad we're in a state that has some teleconferencing and consultation possibilities with the McPat program, the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program, mm -hmm. because there's not enough child psychiatrists to go around, you know, a, a large portion of the pediatric practices in our state can get a child psychiatrist on the phone within half an hour when they're coming in for visits to discuss some things in between while you're waiting to see a get off, off a wait list for a therapist or a child psychiatrist or they're not sure and they want to run by some things with you. That's not for an emergency situation, but I think for these building of distress and these, these challenges and functioning and symptoms, it's great to have that. Absolutely. As, as one who is the recipient of the advice from the McFack program, they're always available to us. They provide excellent, timely suggestions to the primary care practices, and they're an invaluable piece in helping children and teens and families that are in distress. And um, Chase, you mentioned, you know, call 911, go to the emergency room. Absolutely. Uh, we would encourage the same thing for our patients and families, but also just to feel free to make an appointment with your primary care person because so often uh, issues escalate with children and parents and teens in the home. And then when the appointment is made and people can be under a little bit more controlled setting and we have an opportunity to talk, it seems like you know the, the volcano explodes and we can get back to a more manageable uh, emotional state. And that's, that's when the healing can start to occur. You, you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. And uh, I, I think that just bringing the story to light, getting everyone in one room and talking in a level-headed, uh, mature, uh, respectful way uh, goes a long way towards healing. And then your primary care person can determine with with the parent, with the teen, it's like, okay, we do want to pursue counseling. There have been issues in our family that we need to talk about that have been there for quite some time. And the pandemic has just brought them to light. So yes, it's it's time for us to, to access some counseling. And then hopefully uh, your primary care person can, uh, can arrange for that. I also want to say in terms of uh, emergency situations. We've had many situations where uh, difficult uh, language, difficult um, emotions have been expressed or found out on, um, on social media. Uh, friends that will call um, someone else's parent and say, did you know that Joey is having these thoughts about wanting to die or, or he has a plan to, uh, to jump off a bridge uh, this afternoon? Are you aware of that? So, so being, resp being responsive to your child's social media situation, I think is, is extremely important. And don't, don't um, dis discount those um, situations when they do come up. I think they're very important in telling. Absolutely. And just to tie everything together with what you guys said, don't, I mean, parents, teens, kids, everybody, just don't be afraid to ask, right? If, if you're in a position where you start thinking and even, um, even thinking proactively, you know, my, um, my kid's not getting outside as much, you know, my kid's not, you know, eating a little less, my kid's complaining of stomach aches and feeling a little worried about going back to school. I mean, that's a great conversation to even just bring up at your pediatrician's office, you know, this mm -hmm. is what's going on, um, and to explore the options. Um, but also, if things do intensify, don't, 
don't be afraid to ask, right? And also the teens uh, looking out for other, their other teen friends, right? And their other, you know, their other friends, like, don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to um, get, get help when needed. Thank you all. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of questions to get to. So um, I'm going to jump right into those so we can try and get as many as possible covered. Um, some of them are for, for um, specific folks, but feel free to jump in, um, whoever wants to answer. Um, so let's get started. Some children struggled with social anxiety prior to the pandemic, and many have amplified many have amplified their anxiety, some to the point of agoraphobia. How can I help my child transition back to school and decrease social anxiety? That's a really great question. Um, and I, I appreciate the question and I appreciate the, the you know, the, the guardian, the caregiver, like asking, right? How, how can I prepare my kid for going back to school knowing that this is what's going on? Um, you know, um, from from a treatment perspective, you know, one, I think this is a great space to, you know, ask around about wait lists for therapy, um, connecting with a psychotherapist, number one. Um, number two, you can start small, right? I think that's, that's the biggest thing is, you know, if you think about, we've been in this pandemic for quite some time, right? And so some been over, over a year, right? And so, and a lot of our lives have been spent at home. And so it is a little anxiety provoking for a lot of people to go back, right? Um, what is my life going to look like when I go back to the office? What is my life going to look like when I go back to school? And so um, you can start small, right? Um, and and um, work with your child's therapist in order to um, build um, build in more opportunities, right? To, to um, you know, kind of show them that the social, like socialization, right? Doesn't have to be as scary as the worry thoughts are really making it, um, making it to, um, making them believe. Um, another great tip is your school is a valuable resource. Um, they, uh, the counselors and the school psychologists and the teachers and the administrators, they are there to help you. So please definitely connect with your school, ask about resources that, um, that they can provide in order to provide that bridge uh, to your child as they go back to school. Thank you. Um, next up, how do you help tween and young teenage children whose friends talk a lot about suicide and say that they have attempted to kill themselves? And what should I be doing as a parent with regards to those other children whose parents I may never have met since the pandemic has really closed down social opportunities? Yeah, that's a really important set of questions there and ones that we get a lot. I think I'd like to answer in reverse first. I, I think. Certainly, I'm a child psychiatrist and pediatrician, so I'm a mandatory reporter. But I think even as parents, you know, hearing that other friends of, of your child are talking about suicide and suicidal thoughts, that's a life-threatening condition. I think you know, we should really be thinking about reaching out to, you know, the, the guardians and parents of those children to make sure they're aware, right? Because you probably likewise would not want to be in a similar situation of learning that your child was talking to other people's friends about feeling thoughts of suicide. Or, or that they had, you know, tried to kill themselves and that you didn't know, right? So I, I think that's a, it's a challenging thing to do and, and, and may feel awkward, but really, really important, even if the consequences of it are, are, are really uncomfortable. I think likewise, with regards to your, your teens who are, who are hanging out with, with other youth who are talking about suicide a lot or, or talking about times they've tried to kill themselves, you know, I think this really underscores the importance of having open communication about the psychological state and emotions of your child and talking about sadness and depression and talking about suicidal thoughts and feelings and feeling like you know as much as you can already. I think there are some parents that notice that there are some youth that you know, have been really supportive and are helpful to, to normalize a sense of like, I've been depressed and things got hard once, but I'm working through it. And that that could be like a really great friend for their team to have as a, as a good model. And some parents, when they find out a little bit more information start to understand that maybe those youth have, have really started to self-identify as someone who is su suicidal all the time and that they, they really are like gratifying that experience and uh, are, are really, I think, in a way, having a, a, a negative influence to maybe feel like their teen has to think or, or talk about those things more often than that too. And I think sometimes you have to make some really tough decisions as a parent, right? It is normal teenage development to find a peer group and to identify with them more than you're gonna to start to identify with your parents and your family. And if an identity of a peer group 
is having any type of behavior that you feel like is negative and putting your kid at risk, whether that's drinking alcohol all the time and, and doing drugs, or whether it's avoiding school and uh, skipping school, or whether that's that someone is always suicidal and always questioning whether life is worth living, those are things that may be the tough decisions you have to make as a parent to be able to set some limits about what type of influence mm -hmm. kids have over each other. I mean, we see this with cyberbullying and with wanting to model and be like the latest Instagram star or, or the celebrity I most identify with or this popular kid or, or this person that I, I know at school and wanting to model that behavior. And I think we really have to respect that normal development of teens to want to identify with other groups outside their family and to, to really respect the influence that can have on them. Thank you. Um, next up, when your child's anxiety and way of coping manifests itself through anger and judgment towards others who don't beha behave in a way they feel is right, how do you help them both manage the anxiety and be kinder towards others? Uh, so think, uh, just as an introduction, just to uh, go ahead and, and address the issue directly with the teen uh, at the appropriate time, there's good times to talk and there's not good times to talk. But I think just say, hey, I was a little concerned about your comments today and thoughts. And uh, can we just explore that today with conversation? Heather? Yeah, I was um, going to say that that's, that's hard, right? And so I think this also goes and ties back to it's, it's okay to have you know, to feel sadness, to feel worry. I do feel like sometimes teens, um, uh, or at least, you know, kids that I talk to, sometimes it can, they feel like it's easier to be angry, right, than to show um, a vulnerability. And this is where, you know, normalizing the conversation that it's okay. This is okay to feel worried and sad. It's okay to feel angry as well. Those are all emotions we have. Um, and um, at the same time, like I'm noticing, like you seem hurt, right? Like can we can we have an open conversation about it um, and and talk through like what are some things that could be helpful? Yeah, I think it's a, it sounds like Heather, what you're saying is one of the tenets we use as psychiatrists, psychologists all the time, which is that it's totally okay to have emotions and feeling about something, but that does not always grant someone the right to behave or act however they want to from that emotion. So. To, to really separate those two things. Absolutely validating your feelings. Let's talk about it, think about it. But just because you were maybe upset that, you know, this classmate didn't wear a mask at the same time, doesn't mean it's okay for you to scream at them in, in front of the rest of the classmates. What's a different choice or what can we work on? Certainly those are some more complicated nuances that are great to have a therapist to sort of think about and work together and through. But I think that that concept is helpful because sometimes parents get in the conundrum of, feeling like you have to invalidate the whole thing. Like, look how you behave. Like, none of this is okay. Well, it is okay to feel like you feel. And, and yeah, I understand. I kind of feel the same way too. And the the way that you acted towards, you know, your classmate, because of the way you're feeling, we need to work on that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is a healthy, a healthy way, healthy and adaptive way to um, take care of this emotion that you are feeling? Um, next one, we're gonna touch a little bit on identity. Um, we have a question saying, how do I help support, help or, and or support my child who is currently struggling with their identity? My daughter is now saying she wants to identify as a boy or non-binary when she has never stated this before. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important question too. I think like so many things throughout the pandemic, sometimes parents say, Oh, with increased stressors, is, is something like this happening because of the pandemic? But really, I would rephrase that and say, because of all the stressors of the pandemic, so many things that people are having emotional struggles with and challenges are coming to the surface or people are vocalizing more. So I think we've seen higher rates of teenagers talking about, you know, their gender diversity or gender questioning than usual. Not that it's necessarily a new phenomenon, but we're noticing that so many more teens are talking about it sooner once they've made these revelations or, or are working through and doing self-discovery around these things. So I think just the first thing to say is this is a really challenging thing for all family members to hear from their youth and to feel caught off guard and to feel like, why didn't they tell me before? Or what does this really mean? There's so many questions and emotions that come with that. So please be generous to yourself. Fortunately, we're in a state where we have lots of access to gender diverse clinics and support 
where we have physicians, endocrinologists, and adolescent medicine doctors, alongside social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, who specialize in working with families where a youth is gender questioning or is gender diverse. And this is so important uh, for mental health and behavioral health concerns because gender questioning and gender diverse youth have extremely high rates of self injury, of bullying, of suicide attempts and suicide and other maladaptive coping mechanisms like substance use compared to their, their peers. It's a really distressing thing, really vulnerable to bullying and distress and use themselves as they're going through this process and questioning or identifying their, their gender identity. So I think it's super important, even more than maybe some other situations to make sure you're getting adequate support and to make sure that people are in gender affirming circumstances where you're supporting your team in the fact that they're exploring their identity. And that doesn't mean that you're saying, okay, I'm totally 100% on board with everything now that you just told me for the first time and I'm not allowed to have any emotions about it. It means that you're supporting them through this and being open mm -hmm. and thoughtful with them because this is such a vulnerable period for youth. Again, we've, there's been multiple reports, even a, a big study here out of Massachusetts where they queried some high schoolers showing that there's three or four times higher rates of suicide attempts by gender diverse and gender questioning youth in Massachusetts compared to their non, you know, straight peers. And I think from a primary care point of view that uh, the question of gender identity is on our teen questionnaire. So I think primary care uh, people are, are well versed in um, and experienced in dealing with these questions. And uh, the, the primary pediatric office is often the first setting that these questions are raised. And uh, I would also like to underscore the excellence of the clinics uh, that we work with uh, that, that explore gender issues. They're, they're highly skilled, very experienced, and can be enormously helpful to teens and to parents. Great, thank you. Um, can you suggest some programs to give my 15 year old daughter the tools she needs to overcome debilitating social anxiety that is causing school and social avoidance? Uh, I, I think tying, going back to what I said earlier, I mean, there's, there's so many tools and um, start with um, seeking out a therapist to, to help your child, seeking out um, uh, access to um, what's in your community, right? You know, uh, Fred mentioned earlier about, you know, connecting with, you know, uh, uh, like what's like your community supports, like your, you can access clergy or you can access your school, you can access the Y, like there's, there's lots of other resources out there. Um, when it, um, and that's a good place to start. And when it comes to specific tools, that encouragement, starting small, um, you know, acknowledging that the, these feelings are there, but these feelings don't have to define who they are and what they do, right? That they can still um, uh, go into and be social and be active and not let these uh, feelings or these thoughts stop them. And I just I just like to add on to to Heather's point. Then I think to start small is a good idea for most teens. I think uh, many successful families have just tried to identify one or two other families uh, where um, the parents have perhaps both been uh, immunized. They feel protected. They're making good decisions about wearing masks. They're making good decisions about social distancing. And um, when parents can identify those other families that that kind of take the pandemic seriously, and then they can begin to introduce their teens if they're not already friends and make make safe public uh, meetings possible. Uh, I think that's a good first step for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kern, Dr. Potts, I'm hearing you saying that, you know, the treatment for avoidance is no longer avoiding, right? And <laughs> I, I think a basic concept here is that throwing someone in the deep end is not really going to work out too well. That's going to be overwhelming and probably set people back or just not be successful. And you have to find ways that you can wade into the shallow end and start to start to get going. It might require you to sort of maybe hop off that first step into the shallow end and, and make a leap at some point, but it needs to be something where you can have some success. Right, because the, the best treatments for anxiety are things that build confidence and success. That's the best medicine for it. Not an actual medicine, but confidence and success. And however that can happen is going to be useful. 
I'll also just say that sometimes when things get really, really challenging, despite lots of effort, lots of work, having therapists and our psychiatrists that are really working on helping reduce that avoidance and feel more confident, you know, there are some types of programming, like what we call partial hospital programs or, or day patient programs, where, you know, about school hours, maybe it's like eight to two or nine to three for a week or two, that people will do a comprehensive amount of programming through certain centers of, you know, psychological excellence in the community and some of our academic medical centers here to sort of help get back on track with that level of, of social anxiety. It's really impairing functioning despite lots of people or concerted efforts. Um, the next question I'm going to ask, it's going to be for all three of you. This is a really important one, and it actually is coming from a child. How do I tell my parents that I want to see a mental health professional? I would just, I will, first off, I would applaud the courage that that uh, young person has demonstrated by asking that question and kudos to you and uh, just telling, uh, telling uh, your parents or guardians and other adults in your life that I really would like some help. That's the first step towards healing. So I applaud, I applaud the question and you're well on your way to feeling better, I think, just because you've asked it. Uh, you know, I think this is where the open communication can be really helpful. Um, you know, for uh, depending upon the age, you know, um, you know, ask your parent if you feel comfortable, right? You know, who, you, who might be available, right? Um, you know, another great is your pediatrician might actually be a good place to start, depending upon your age. During your, your regular visit, you can bridge that, you can ask that question. Uh, what are the options? What, what can I seek out? Um, you know, sometimes I will also say um, that it seems scarier in, right, than actually saying it out loud, right, and asking for help. So if you have, if you feel like you're in a position where you have that good alliance and that good relationship with your parent, guardian, caregiver, then, um, you know, sometimes you just have to take that first step right into the shallow water, right, and just, and ask, um, and, um, uh, and trust that in that relationship that you have. Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, I really like the idea, Heather, that you said, and maybe we're volunteering Dr. Kern for some uh, so some work here, but I, I've met youth who have, you know, called up their pediatrician's office and said, I want to make an appointment and want to talk with the pediatrician alone and say, I need to tell my parents that I, I need to see a therapist and I really need your support here, or can you help me do this, or can you do this for me? And I think that's a really great use of, of people's healthcare professionals to partner and and maybe it's not your pediatrician. I think there are some teens who feel like this conversation is not going to go well that need some other partner. Maybe they feel like they can talk to their aunt or their uncle who, who's going to deliver this information to their parents together. Or maybe it's an older brother or a sister, or maybe it's a community member that, or, or a pastor, you know, or a mom or somebody that they feel like is going to be able to validate and have this conversation. And not just like to help protect them, deliver the message, but also to to really show them, listen, I've thought about this a lot. A lot. I am serious. Look at the extents I went to to do this. I, I think the other thing to say too is that so many teenagers today have so much less stigma, luckily, about mental health. And you maybe at the same time should prepare for the fact that maybe your parent might feel a little bit more threatened or challenged by this. Or what does this mean? Does this mean I'm not a good parent or something like that? Or, oh, I don't know if you need that. Um, and I think that I would say be prepared for maybe their first reaction to not be what you hope for, but give them give them a, give them a chance and, and say, I know this is important, but this is something I'm going to do to make, help myself and make myself feel better and really to, to be persistent with it. And maybe you need a, a, a family member or community member or your pediatrician to back you up if that first conversation doesn't go well, because this is important. And I just like Dr. Potts and Dr. Kern did, I applaud you for having the courage to step up and say, this is something you need to do and it will be helpful for you. The thing that it's, the, the thing that excites us in the primary care setting with integrated behavioral health counselors is if we can give a 10, 12, or 14 year old uh, child and young teen the skills that they need to help manage their anxiety to get to navigate life, they're going to benefit from those skills that they learn from their therapist for the rest of their lives. And that's, that's a very exciting and thrilling uh, proposition for all primary care providers. And one last point is also if you do feel really uncomfortable, you really don't feel like that relationship is there with your parent, still don't let that stop you from asking for help from somebody. 
Um, so there are anonymous tip line, there's anonymous, you know, um, uh, call centers that you can call if you feel like this is an emergency. Um, you do not need uh, to be 18 in order to call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline in order to seek, seek out um, help for crisis situations. So um, I, I know that sometimes you might feel stuck, but don't let that stop you from, from asking for help. We are almost out of time. It's went by really quickly. Um, so one last question piggybacking off of off of the previous question um can we touch a little bit on overall family mental health during this time and how families can support each other through you know all of these transitional periods back to school back to work etc absolutely um and i i really do appreciate that question as well um and that Parents, caregivers, older, you know, older siblings, aunts, uncles, everybody, we are the models for good, you know, how we take care of ourselves, that self-care. Um, and I, I always talk about the like a little pyramid, right? And when it talks of when it comes to your child's mental health, right? In order for you to be there, be present, underlying the found, you know, the foundation of that is also your own mental health. Um, and your own self-care. And so taking that moment, right, and to be that model of using healthy adaptive coping strategies. Um, and it also can be very helpful to carve out time every day as a family to turn off the turn off the cell phones, turn off the TV. Let's have a genuine conversation about your day. Um, let's talk about, you know, the ups and the downs. And, um, and that's, it can be very very uh, powerful way to uh, keep that communication open, but also model effective, healthy and effective coping skills and strategies and self-care. I think in addition to those great tips that Heather provided, I'd just say, try to cultivate an attitude of gratitude within your family. There's a lot of bad news out there. There has been for the last 15 months, but there's a lot of good things going on too in the world. And I think we need to try to identify those, uh, uh, cult help cultivate that in our children and focus on what we can control during the pandemic. I think getting outside, uh, especially now that it's nice weather is very therapeutic for most of us. Uh, get regular sleep and just remember parents that children tend to thrive with structure and predictability. And so maintaining structure and consistency in their lives um, is a really important thing as well. Yeah, Belinda, what Dr. Fox and Dr. Kern were, were saying, I, I think, you know, your children know you probably better than about anyone else. And they know if you're having a hard time and things that are affecting you affect them. Mm -hmm. If you're not taking good self-care, why should they, right? Teenagers are really good about pointing out hypocrisy and say, oh, you say, I need to do this, but you never go to bed on time and you have your phones on and in, in, in bed, you know, parents. So I, I think it's, it's, you really gotta take care of yourself to be able to take care of others well. We say this all the time, especially in acute hospital settings where we're working long hours and, and unusual hours at that. But I think it's true of families too. You, you, this is a, uh, everything we've said today is not just applying to children. This applies to you all as parents and adults too. It things to sort of think about your own mental health and well being. And the more you can model that for your kids, the better it's gonna be for them to accept help and to recognize some of their own signs and symptoms of, of not doing too well and to feel like, oh, hey, I can do something about this. Oh you know, mom actually takes some time out of her, her day every day to go for a walk like that. Maybe I, I can do something like that too. Or, or, or I guess I'll listen to mom more about that because I noticed she, she does that too. I think the setting of virtual everything and being on phones and electronics all the time, unfortunately has created this overwhelm and overlap and bleeding into other parts of our day that used to be protected. And so I think intentional time, intentional time where we're actually paying attention to what we're doing, whether that's everyone's off electronics, no TV on or on the dinner table to talk to each other for 45 minutes, or whether that's like one hour every Sunday, we're just gonna go together and spend time together doing things together, not just being next to each other while we're all doing our own things, I think is really important to recapture a sense of togetherness and well-being and safety and structure for, for families. Those things can be really, really powerful. And I think when things are not just a, a, a little challenging, when people are having moderate to serious distress, it's time for professionals to know and, and to get some help. And I think if there's been some really concerning moments, not waiting to the next crisis before you're really trying to get some access to services and care, 
to help prevent it from happening again because we all wish that something's not going to happen again and that's past us and it's really easy to do that we're all really busy and how can we fit another thing into our lives but it's so much better to get off a wait list to see a therapist and to say actually we're okay we, 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 we don't we don't need you right now because the therapist that's a huge wait list and they can just go on to the next person it's not going to bother them then say wow that was a two month to find wait list for a therapist and now that two months came around, I really need somebody, but now I need to wait another two months to find someone and I'm in crisis now, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a situation we see for a lot of our families who are in the ER in crisis. And uh, I think a lot of those family members wish, looking back, that they, they had done something different. And it's hard out there. I'm not saying it's easy. There's huge workforce shortages, like we said, but really important considerations during these challenging times. Well, Dr. Kern, Dr. Potts, Dr. Samsel, thank you. We are at time. Um, we have more questions to answer and for everything we didn't get to today, it will be addressed on our Facebook page soon. I want to thank all of you who attended. There were a lot of folks on uh, this webinar today. And for any additional sources, resources you're looking for about COVID-19 and kids health, you can check out bostonchildrens.org front slash COVID. So thank you all again.